voice of the soprano Véronique Jeanse, an artist honoured not once but twice at this year's Gramophone Awards, the focus of this Gramophone podcast. It's produced in association with Wigmore Hall, who, as well as sponsoring our chamber music category, play host this week to a veritable feast of Gramophone Award winners, Mahan Esfahani, Magdalena Kojina, Mitsuko Uchida, Stephen Isilis, Alina Ibrahimova and Lisa Davidson. Full details at wigmore-hall.org.uk. I'm James Jolly and I'm joined by Gramophone's editor, Martin Cullingford, and deputy editor, Tim Parry, to introduce and talk through the awards that were handed out at a ceremony in London this week. And I should mention that our partners this year for the awards are Apple Music Classical, the London Mozart Players, our band for the evening, the British Phonographic Industry and the Global Foundation for the Performing Arts. Now, even though one recording emerges as our record of the year, we all tend to have our favourites. And I'm going to pin my colours to the mast and say that the album that I probably paid more than any other from the list of winners is the one that won the Chamber Award. Two string quintets by Mozart, played by the Cachor Eben with the viola player Antoine Tamisti. Martin, did this appeal to you? It did, uh, absolutely. The Eben Quartet really are regulars to our awards pages, previously in works such as Dutier and Schoenberg. But... Here in Mozart, music right at the heart of the chamber repertoire. But they leave it feeling as excitingly modern or of our time, to use that phrase, as anything composed in much more recent history. It feels very exploratory, individually even, but never without justification and always convincingly. And there's such a wonderful sense of inspired collaboration. Antoine Tamastet as their guest additional viola player, clearly a fully integrated colleague. Uh, Tim, I mean, I seem to remember at our a voting uh, meeting you were very enthusiastic too. I love this record and I think exploratory is absolutely right. I think it's there's a real sense of drama and narrative to it. I know some people found it too sort of preconceived, too controlled, uh, lacking spontaneity. I didn't feel that at all. It kind of almost had a, a kind of operatic quality to it and and, and that it they do I can see why some people feel it's maybe a little bit pulled around, but always for me for real dramatic effect I, I completely love it and it dances so beautifully it's Absolutely. got that sort of lightness of touch and it Absolutely. really is enchanting and as I said I've I played it tons of times yeah. I mean I don't you know well into double figures yeah. I was well, on holiday you, you, and that's all I played you, you and I raved about it to each other bef- before it even won the chamber category we both, we both clearly love this record it's super and I think if you're asking someone to listen to a chamber recording, this is a real showcase for exactly what that genre in a studio can do. In a and it also has the promise that there must be, there must be further volumes to come. Let's hope two more. Now, the Choral uh, Award, a slightly unusual one, this. This is Choral Works by John Cage. I mean, a lot of people probably wouldn't even realise that John Cage wrote uh, masses of choral music. I mean, this is a truly virtuoso album. Latvian Radio Choir, conducted by Sigvard Kiava on on Dean. This was a revelation to me. I I, I really enjoyed this record. The, the, the singing is absolutely stunning. You expect that of a Latvian, Latvian radio choir. They're a wonderful, wonderful choir. Um, but th- the thing that struck me with this was the diversity of the music. It's such a range. Um, and really, they, they, they rise to the challenge. There are lots of challenges and they, they, they rise to them superbly. I mean, a lot of it is very approachable. I mean, it's not difficult at all. I mean, there is some tough stuff on this, but, but there's a surprising amount of, you know, really very, very engaging stuff. There, yeah, absolutely. And, and firstly, it's lovely to see a recording of music of, of this era and nature in the choral category. In fact, one of the defining aspects of this year's winners, as I'm sure we'll come on to talk about, is the amount of 20th century or even later music. And for me, it was very much a, an album of two halves in a good way, each impressive in, in different ways. The hymns and variations, I thought, were some of the most moving music that I heard in the whole process of listening and voting. And, and certainly when you say accessible, just in terms of just engaging audiences, that's very true. And then with 4-6, some of the most extraordinarily eccentric but vocally virtuosic singing that, that you're likely to hear from an album of this nature. There's such a, a superb choir and this really just shows their, how excellent they are in, in such a, a range of music. Uh, 
Uh, the Concerto Award. Now, this is an interesting one because it's actually, it's not an original concerto, shall we say. It's, it's a transcription of the Elgar Cello Concerto for viola. And it's twinned on the release by uh, Bloch's Suite for Viola and Orchestra, which is a, a bona fide viola concertante piece, played wonderfully by Timothy Ridout with the BBC Symphony Orchestra, conducted by Martin Brabins on a Harmonia Mundi release. Martin, I mean, what do you feel about a transcription of this of this work because we're so used to hearing the you know the cello the bow digging into the strings yeah i mean it did i got to be honest it, it took me a bit of getting used to when elgar wrote the cello concerto so powerfully understanding the resonance of that particular instrument and, and the passages that the the composer places within it but the greatest accolade i can really give for this album is that you i, I did get used to it and actually it its interpretation succeeds on its own terms. It manages to be moving and compelling within its own sound world. And perhaps some of those lighter, sort of more fragile sections, which, which the cello won't necessarily bring out as well, just, just give a sort of fragility that, that actually is a large part of what Elgar is trying to achieve with the work. And Martin Brabins conducts the orchestra fabulously well. He really is a terrific conductor. He's a, he's a fantastic musician, isn't he? And in, 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 in such a range of, such a range of music. Um, I... I like Martin, I slightly struggled. I love transcriptions. I've no problems with playing things on instruments that they weren't originally written for. But I, I struggled to get past the fact that it wasn't a cello. And having got past that, this is wonderfully poetic playing. Um, it's it's rich. It's tender. It, it's it's an absolute triumph for Timothy Ridout. And the um, the Bloch coupling is a is a. I mean, I suspect not that many people will know the piece, but it is really amazing. It's it's really fabulous. Absolutely, and I I suspect this is probably the Bloch's finest recording available. Probably, I, I could imagine for the Elgar as well. In that version, it will take some uh, some beating. The Contemporary Award goes to uh, another Ondine album. This is a collection of orchestral works by the Finnish composer Lotta Venikoski. Sigla, Flounce and Sedecim. Uh, one of those is a harp concerto played by Sivan Magen. Uh, and all three works are played by the Finnish Radio Symphony Orchestra, conducted by their British conductor, Nicholas Collon. A, a slight turning around of, uh, of of matters, as we tend to have a lot of Finnish conductors conducting British orchestras, and this is does it the other way round. Um, she's got a very distinctive voice. This is not this is not thorny music at all. This is actually very approachable music. Beautiful colours, terrific sense of rhythm. I mean, was this was this high on your list of favourites? Yeah, I mean, she does have a, a very distinctive voice, but I think what's very interesting is that we get different sides of that a, a very distinctive voice. Um, a proms premiere, a, a a work in, engaging with something of modern resonance, and then a, a concerto. Um, and I think what is rather wonderful, it's it it's exactly what a contemporary composer record can do. It can be a showcase of those different facets of, of what a composer is writing, but not in any way just feeling like a calling card. It actually feels like a, a really beautifully put together programme. And it is stunningly well played. I mean, the Finnish Radio Symphony Orchestra, radio orchestra, so they have that kind of versatility, but they really, really inside this music. It's, it's superb really... advocacy for, for, for the music. And Nicholas Collin, who many people will perhaps know best through his work with Aurora, um, is, is so good at getting getting to the heart of music that's unfamiliar and he's made i mean he made a whole stream of, of really terrific recordings with his his finnish orchestra mm. and this clearly is uh, very near the top if not at the top yeah and i think that's what radio orchestras often do so incredibly well that's almost one of their sort of ways on that and i think this this exemplifies that From the very new to the very old and uh, early music. And this is um, a Deutsche Harmonia Mundi album of polyphonic masses by Ludwig Daza. Probably not the first name to 
sort of bounce off the tongue when you're thinking about uh, German Renaissance music. But uh, this features uh, one of the great choral groups of uh, continental Europe, Huelgas Ensemble, conducted by a veteran of this particular field, Paul van Nevel. I thought this was st a stunning record, and actually it, it did incredibly well in the early music category. I mean, it, it was out there by a very long way. Yeah, I mean, I'm not going to claim a... A great knowledge of Ludwig Dasser prior to this award season, but having now listened to this, it is superb music. It's, it's dramatic, moving, as, as well as elegant and compelling. And Paul van Neville's Huelgas Ensemble really make the most engaging case for it too. They're, and that's not to imply it's just here as a sort of piece of advocacy, but actually they, they, they believe in this music as being really, really interesting and they, they bring out what is interesting about it. And it's beautifully recorded too. Stunningly recorded, yeah. It's interesting that in... In years gone by, the, the early category has, has has tended to divide the critics who vote in it. Um, and I think this year, this was a pretty mm. overwhelming winner, um, which which is, yeah, I can I can see why. In fact, there's another Ludwig does a recording coming out on Hyperion from Cinquecento. So m maybe this is something of a, a of a revival. And I thought also it was very interesting when, we, when it came to looking and discussing the recording of the year, it's not so much that it didn't just divide the early people, but actually it kind of united people who wouldn't normally have considered themselves specialists in this field at all. Mm. Now, this is definitely an album that even if you don't think you like early music, I think I really would recommend you give it a whirl because um, I think there's lots of rewards to be had there. <laughs> Now, a few years ago, we separated the uh, piano recordings from the instrumental category. So piano obviously deals with piano recordings. Instrumental basically uh, embraces anything played on anything other than a piano. So it could be a, a solo violin, viola, cello, flute, harp, whatever. And the winner this year is uh, an album that features two solo instruments, and obviously not together, uh, played by Nurit Stark. She plays the viola and the violin on this. And this is a focus on 20th century Hungarian music for solo viola or violin, music by Bartok, Peter Ertvers, Ligeti and Veres. Uh, really, I thought it's an amazing record. I mean, she really knows what she's doing in, in this repertoire. Absolutely super. Um, I, I thought particularly the Bartok solo sonata and the Ligeti too um, really struck me as fantastic performances. Yeah, I mean, as you say, James, we created this category to make sure non-piano solo music got the attention it's deserved. And, and this kind of exposed, sometimes visceral, always brilliantly played virtuosity is exactly what we wanted to highlight. And for me, solo violin and, of course, viola recordings always feel like very bold intimate and highly personal experiences and this from New York Stark is exactly that. <laughs> Now, that album was uh, on the Swedish Beast label, and Beast have been named our label of the year in their 50th anniversary year and also the 80th birthday year of their founder, Robert von Barr. I mean, a truly wonderful, wonderful label that you know, embraces such a staggering breadth of, of repertoire from, you know, the complete Bach cantatas from Japan, the complete Mahler and Beethoven symphonies from Minnesota, whole swathes of European, northern European music. I mean, the uh, Edward Tubin symphonies were one of the earliest series, all the works of Sibelius, the piano works of Grieg, and numerous song records from the likes of Carolyn Sampson. Uh, and also, it's a label that identifies talent before a lot of the, the rest of the world hears about it. I mean, for example, Alexandra Kantarov, who carried off the Grand Prix at the uh, International Tchaikovsky Competition in 2019, he was already recording for BIS. And of course, last year's Gramophone Young Artist of the Year, Johan Dahlina, uh, is also a BIS artist. So um, I think this is a, a really thoroughly deserved prize. I couldn't agree more. You, you've mentioned two of the superb young artists that they've they've been championing Kantarov and, and Dahlina. But I mean, in, when writing about this award within the magazine, I encouraged our readers just to simply look at the BIS recordings shortlisted for this year's 
Awards, the Green Gold Quartet performing Schoenberg Quartet, Pascal Roffe with an album of music by Ravel, Sanson Piano Concertos from Kantorov, as, as you've mentioned, an all-Hungarian programme that we've already discussed by Nurek Stark, and Beethoven and Mozart transcriptions performed by Paul Wee. But that's just a mere slither of the 2,700 albums in their catalogue. And 2,700 recordings, which are all available because nothing is deleted, which I think is a really wonderful thing to say about the label. So individual artists and new ones at that and those extraordinary series that you've referred to. It's it's a model of what a record label could be. And it's all led by this inspirational figure who founded it, has believed in it and listens to everything that he has sent for consideration. And like a, a, a great record label should, they identify young talent and develop it and nurture it and work with it over a long over the long term and they, and they don't they're not trying to make two or three records with an artist who they then decide actually maybe that's not for us they, they don't start working with these artists until they think actually they are for us and here's well here's a little bit of one of those recordings that martin discussed here's a little bit of uh, alexandra kantaroff playing saint <laughs> Now, the opera category this year went to something slightly unusual, actually. This was uh, Michael Tippett's opera, The Midsummer Marriage, uh, a wonderful cast uh, with uh, the English National Opera Chorus and the London Philharmonic Orchestra and Choir conducted by Edward Gardner on the LPO's own label. This was actually a concert performance. This was Ed Gardner's first appearance as chief conductor of the LPO and uh, clearly a labour of love. I mean, he, he has been uh, fairly forthcoming about his passion for the music of Tippett, so I suspect we're probably going to see uh, a lot more. But Midsummer Marriage is just full of, of glorious, glorious sounds. This was quite a statement of intent from Ed, Edward Gardner with, with his first first performance of the LPO. It, it, it's a fantastic recording of, a, of clearly an, an important opera. I suppose the question is, how does it stack up against Colin Davis? I, is that even the only other recording? I don't know whether there have been any others. Um, I think it is. Yeah. yeah. And I, I'm, the feeling I get uh, is not my specialist area, as you, as you know, but it, the the singers on the Colin Davis recording clearly are, are of a very high level. Um, and what marks this out is the orchestral playing, which is super. And maybe that's a product of it being a live recording. It's about the LPO. It's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a concert performance. Um, and it's much more, I think, about the, the quality of the orchestra. Um, and it's, it's, it's super. Yeah, and the, the notion of an, an event is aptly applied here at work, which its advocates argue should be much better known than it is. And its advocates very much here um, giving the most extraordinary performance. I think it's, it's, it's a really wonderful lesson. I don't know who they really are, but I've seen them since boyhood. I've come near on summer nights and mornings such as these. Then is the temple nearer. They are close. Well, the piano category this year saw a, a wonderful musician uh, returning to pick up his seventh gramophone award. This is Christian Zimmermann. Uh, recordings from him are few and far between. And this is an interesting one because it was actually, it's a sort of recording in two halves. One recorded back in the 90s and one recorded a couple of years ago. And they've stuck together. I have to say it would be quite difficult to tell sound-wise where the, the two lie. But Tim, you're a piano specialist. I mean, can you tell in the playing what I is early and what is late? I think you can. Mm -hmm. um, and I think this is a fantastic record, but I think the real highlight of it is Masks, which was recorded in 1994. I think the variations on a Polish folk theme are also really stunning. Um, but I, I think, for me, the more recent playing has those Zimmerman traits of uber control, if you like, um, and it does slightly detract from the, the sheer spontaneity of it. Masks, I think, is just the Zimmerman at its finest. That, that you, I don't think... I don't think you'll get a fighter masks than that. Um, it's it, the pl the level of the playing is all stunningly h high level, um, but uh, but I, I think in the playing you can see that the the shift in the emphasis that Zimmerman went through over the last 
20 years. And he's always been a great advocate of the music of Szymanowski. I mean, it sort of it punctuates his career at regular intervals. I don't really know why he didn't complete the record back in the 90s. Um, and when we were left with masks waiting for a, a home and it took him however long that is, 25 years, to, to complete to complete it. I would have loved to have heard this album done all from the mid-90s. Yeah, but, but how wonderful to have figures of the stature of, of Zimmerman making records, going into the studio, making recording feel like something significant that's worth worth paying attention to. And it, it, is, it is beautifully played. Now, the song category this year was uh, beautifully timed because uh, the winner was uh, an album of the complete songs of Gabriel Fauré, whose uh, centenary falls next year. This is sung by the French lyric tenor Cyril Dubois with Tristan Raïs uh, at the piano. This is an aparté release. And uh, it's quite unusual for one voice to sing all of Fauré's songs. But uh, there's an intimacy about the way this is recorded. And as I said, you know, a beautiful, beautiful lyric tenor voice. I remember, I, I think I first discovered it on the gramophone recording of the year from a few years ago, the complete recording of Berlioz's Trojans, where he had a relatively small part. And I just thought, wow, that is an incredible voice. And, and I've heard him a number of times since. And I just, I just mesmerised at the, at the sheer beauty of it. And I think he brings to these songs something very, very special. Yeah, it is an extraordinary voice, and I think it's perfectly suited to this kind of repertoire and recording. There's a there's an engaging um, intimacy or or, or, or in, informality in a way, and I think um, what's quite interesting is you said it's quite unusual to hear all of these songs in in one voice, and there could be a danger that 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 would be quite samey. But actually, the complete opposite happens here, and I think he shows the sheer variety that lies in these songs, and perhaps makes us realise it for. For the first time and he's obviously thought about them as each one is an individual song that requires its own identity and its own poetry there's no sense of just working through a list it's and it's they've a, also been really, really nicely put together mm. um in that they create sort of three programs i mean i really wouldn't suggest anybody attempts listening to all of them but uh, you can certainly listen to them in sort of like three panels of a triptych and they work very nicely because they've been very cleverly put together yeah. I, th I think that's absolutely right. I, th I think it. Um, I was going to say it's probably an album to dip into, but no, you're right. You could le you can listen to each of the three programs as an entity. It, it, it's a it's a gorgeous voice, and it's the kind of it's the kind of singing and playing. Actually, Tristan Rice is su super pianist on on this album. It draws you in, and it sort of holds you and doesn't let go until you press stop. I absolutely love this. It's very closely recorded as well, uh, which actually rather suits his voice because he has this sort of mix of head and chest voice um, and and it's the, the the closeness of it you feel absolutely you're there with him in the room <laughs> And uh, another vocal record, this is Voice and Ensemble, which uh, covers everything from sort of operatic uh, excerpts to, um, I suppose, it could take in a work like a Pierre Lunaire, it could take in, I don't know, concert arias, it's quite a wide brief. But the winner is uh, an alpha album called Rival, featuring uh, two wonderful French singers, Sandrine Pio and Véronique Jeans, uh, joined by Le Concert de la Loge conducted by Julien Chauvin, who plays the violin. Um, this is a, an album of sort of early early 18th century, very unusual arias. I mean, most of them I barely even heard of the composer, uh, let alone the opera that they came from, but they're done incredibly well. And these these two singers, they may, they may be styled as rival, but they're clearly very good friends, and they sing uh, they sing beautifully together. Yeah, this is lovely and a, a lot of fun. They they blend exquisitely in duets, but actually there's also a real individuality in their dramatic voices. And, and what's quite interesting is they are, when I say they're quite similar singers, what I mean by that is 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 in terms of their, their stylish interpretive depth and seriousness, and yet also very different in terms of their voices. And I think that's why this album works so well. They feel very much like colleagues you could imagine 
working perfectly in so many duets on stage in opera houses, somehow capturing a scene, but capturing the characters themselves. And uh, this, this, this album perfectly captures that. They're compatible and complementary, but you can always tell which is which. Um, they have very distinctive voices. Um, I thought this is a joyous record. I absolutely loved it. And we should also point out that uh, Véronique Jeans, who did p- appear on about five uh, shortlisted albums as well, uh, she is named our Artist of the Year. I think a, a wonderful musician that uh, we're very proud to be associated with this year. <laughs> Now, our Young Artist of the Year, which generally goes to an artist sort of under the age of, of 30, this year is a violinist, an American player called uh, Stella Chen, and she did a wonderful record that came out uh, last year on Platoon of Music by Schubert for Violin and Piano. And she's clearly a, a very stylish, very elegant player. And certainly when it comes to Schubert, she'd obviously studied this music really, really closely and has a lot to say about it. It's It's very well thought out without lacking spontaneity. Um, she's clearly a very characterful player um, and it's a it's a very promising start to hopefully a long career. Yeah, I mean, what, what do we look for in a young artist of the year? Virtuosity, of course, that that's a given. And then what? Well, or personality. And I think, as you say, Tim, that's, mm. that's very much what we hear in Stella Chen, an artist who already has something distinctive to say, but crucially, a desire to say it. And that, that really does come across. It's a splendid debut album, and I really look forward to whatever follows next. <laughs> from an artist at the start of her career to one who has retired. This is our Lifetime Achievement Award and this goes to uh, Dame Felicity Lott, a wonderful uh, English soprano who's, I suppose, her her sort of centre of musical gravity is perhaps the music of Mozart and, and Richard Strauss. She was a wonderful countess, wonderful Pamina earlier in her career, uh, Marsha Lynn and, and many other Strauss roles. A very stylish, elegant, charming singer. And I think her personality really sort of bubbles through when she performed French operetta, which she made something of a, a something of a, a sort of speciality and earned her a huge following in France, where she's a, a sort of mega star and certainly with her her performances in Offenbach. A, a beautiful voice uh, and a wonderful a wonderful song singer as well. She she sort of rode that that wave that uh, Graham Johnson sort of created with his songmaker's almanac and she was one of that uh, little sort of group of singers. Uh, and and she, she embraced an enormous range of song and particularly she championed British songs really really well. Wonderful singer. Yeah, and I think it's wonderful that we're celebrating with this award someone as identified with operetta and the lighter side of music, as it were, but also Lieder, Schubert, uh, also Mozart, uh, Richard Strauss, and even people like Henze, contemporary music. Um, and then someone who contributed so much of that gloriously surveyed repertoire to record. And I'm glad you mentioned her, her status in France, because I think she's very unusual in being a British singer who the French, particularly the French critics, love singing French music um, and it's so easy for for French listeners to, to think we, we know how our, our music should be sung but she's almost an honorary French person. And it's it's wonderful that actually I think both her, the sort of both of the Offenbach uh, works that she did, uh, the Grand Duchesse de Gerolstein and La Belle Hélène are available on DVD so you can see her and she is absolutely terrific on stage. I mean she's a really wonderful comic actress, mm. really fabulous. <laughs> La blonde, la blonde fille de Lida. J'ai fait quelques bruits dans le monde, Tizi, Arcas, etc. Et pourtant, ma nature est bonne. Mais le moyen de résister, alors que Vénus la fréquente. 
Now, the Concept Album Award is one we introduced four years ago, and it's really there to engage with a new style, not new style, but an increasingly popular style, perhaps, of recording, which is very much conceived of as an album. And it's not just an award for clever programming. I think it's a little bit more than that. I think it's an award for an album where the, the whole is more than the sum of its parts. So it could sort of tell a story almost, or it could tell a sort of historic, it might be a sort of historical survey, as we had a couple of years ago with Christian Piela Marcus, a sort of survey of the cello and the viol. Or it can juxtapose the old and the new, as it did with Sean Schiebe a few years ago, where he was playing on an acoustic guitar and an electric guitar. And this year, I guess there's a little bit of, of an ancient meeting, meeting modern, because this is an album from Delphian called Battle Cry, She Speaks with the mezzo-soprano Helen Charleston and the theorbo player Toby Carr. Martin, did this, um, did this kind of chime with you? It, it did, and it, it really does tell a story, both about the, the role of, of women and their positions within the, the narrative of so many opera stories, but also actually about, about music. We have Purcell, we have Monteverdi, um, and yet we have this extraordinary 16-minute piece by Owen Park, commissioned by Helen Charleston, which, which really brings both music but also the, the narrative right up to date and, 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 and explores the topic from a contemporary perspective. Helen Charleston sings absolutely extraordinarily throughout. She, she's a, a really great communicator, um, but Toby Carr just plays so beautifully on the theorbo, and, and I think the, the combination of the pair of them is, is, is a really, really wonderful collaboration. Yeah, I think it's a perfect example of a great idea, but done stupendously well. I think we have to give a, a word to Toby Carr's theorbo playing, which holds the whole thing together. It's so sensuously beautiful but the, 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 this idea of uh, of a common thread of uh, women who've been forgotten or overlooked um, or, or um, somehow downtrodden um, really I think the springboard of it was the music of Barbara Strozzi who was a, a baroque singer and composer um, and of course Purcell's Dido is is in there and it's all beautifully sung I love the way I mean, she, she's she's absolutely going places, Helen Charleston, mm. and I I love how her phrasing somehow extends beyond the phrase that she's actually in. So you get the sort of seamless unfolding of the music. It's absolutely exquisite. Now, the Spatial uh, Audio Award, in a way, this is a sort of vague nod to Gramophone's centenary the, this year, because we've not we've not uh, lighted on a, a new production. We've actually alighted on something that was probably one of the great studio productions of the whole history of the Gramophone, little G there. Uh, and this was one instalment of the ring cycle that Sir George Schulte recorded with the Vienna Philharmonic for Decca, uh, produced by John Culshaw. I mean, a real classic. And we've chosen the last instalment of the uh, Tetralogy, which actually was the second part. So this is Die Valkyra, which is probably the most, if you're going to listen to one of the, the four ring operas, this is the most sort of excerptable. It's, it, it stands alone. It's action packed from start to end. And it's got some of the, the greatest moments of the ring cycle in it. And listening to it, this in this Dolby Atmos sound is really staggering, absolutely <laughs> staggering. Yeah, no, no, absolutely. And um, and as you say, I think it is really nice that in our centenary year, we've chosen a recording from that period of time when I think the possibilities of studio recording were first being properly realised and, and celebrated. And then with modern technology, um, the whole process of this remastering has, has gone back to looking what was trying to be achieved, obviously very much was achieved, but actually giving the best possible realisation to, to the, the vision of of all those involved at that uh, period of time. And, and growing up, this was one of those iconic recordings that I just, just knew of, um, was in consciousness before you even perhaps listened to it. And to, to be able to hear it so vividly and to be able to celebrate it in this way is a really fabulous thing, I think. And it, I think it's a sort of tribute to the artistry of Gordon Parry, the original engineer who oversaw the recording, that actually it can be refreshed so amazingly well. I mean, it is, it is astounding. And the playing of the Vienna Philharmonic is, is really quite something on this. 
If there had been a gramophone awards back then, this I think I think it definitely would. would. Probably four year, four consecutive years, exactly. or however long it took <laughs> to issue it. <laughs> Now, our Orchestra of the Year, which um, is the only vote that the uh, public is invited to, to join in, we the way we do it is we choose 10 orchestras that have caught our imagination over the course of the 12 months, and we throw these orchestras out for people to listen to and uh, dip into playlists and explore their work on record and then vote. And uh, an astounding 33-plus uh, thousand votes were cast, and 21% of those votes went to this wonderful orchestra that is our Orchestra of the Year. And that's the Deutsche Kammer Philharmonie Bremen from uh, North Germany. For the last 30 years, it's been led by its artistic director, Pavo Jervi. And it pops up this year on uh, quite a few recordings, including uh, Beethoven and Stravinsky violin concertos with Wilder Frang, Haydn symphonies with Pavo Jervi, uh, and a further instalment in uh, Deutsche Grammophon's wonderful Weinberg series with Mirko Grazinitsi Tsila. It's a, it's a very versatile orchestra. It's essentially a chamber orchestra, but it can sort of expand as necessary. But there's a sort of dynamism. There's a sort of chamber music quality. There's a feeling of music making amongst friends on all these recordings. And um, I've only heard them live a couple of times, and each time has been a very, very exciting experience. I think it's delightful that in our centenary year, it's, it's very fitting that our orchestra of the year is one led by someone whose commitment to... Recording as an art form outstrips almost anyone else for sheer size of catalogue, apart from perhaps his father. <laughs> Obviously, Baba Yavi, his father, Nimi Yavi, and they record with other conductors too, of course, though I'm quite sure the enthusiasm and discipline that, that Baba Yavi has helped foster among them is part of their attraction to other artists who want to work with them. Well, let's, let's hear him on a recording that uh, Pavo made with them not that long ago. This is the uh, first volume of a series of the Haydn London symphonies. This is the Deutsche Kammer Philharmonie Bremen. Now, if you've been uh, following the categories and ticking them off, you'll realise that, uh, that we've still one more to go. And this is the orchestral category, and I should also say that it's our recording of the year. This is uh, the Danish National Symphony Orchestra, conducted by Fabio Luisi in Nielsen's Fourth and Fifth Symphonies, the fourth, of course, being the inextinguishable Danish orchestra, Absolutely, in its own idiom here, with music by a fellow Dane, Carl Nielsen, but conducted by an Italian, which is an interesting sort of fusion, I suppose, of, of cultures. But it clearly worked. Absolutely, it worked. It's, it's, and he, it, you get the feeling that Fabio Luisi has lived with this music uh, for a long time. These are stunning performances. Um, in fact, the whole cycle is, is superb. Um, and it, it, it's, it's this particular album, um, which as a, an album is available to stream um, the the if you want the physical set you need to get all six symphonies in a, in a box um, but I can definitely recommend doing that um, they're all fantastic the, the the fourth I think is particularly fine um, and the, the the string playing on it is absolutely glorious um, I there are times in the fifth where I think the one thing I lacked was that wonderful side drum cadenza where um, Nielsen instructs the, the, the player to try to break up the music and the, disrupt the flow of the music at all costs. And he doesn't quite do that. But everything else about it, I think, is really super. Yeah, it's just such stylish orchestral playing, playing which seems to relish every lyrical section, every bit of rhythmic vitality. And the, the sheer resonance of the orchestral sound is, is hugely impressive. And you refer to the whole series, Tim, and I, I think you're absolutely right. If you want to explore Nielsen's music, 
uh, if you want to explore his symphonies, then this is an absolutely brilliant way of, of doing that. And this is the, the pinnacle of that series. And I think it's a very deserving recording of the year, both on the grounds of the music making itself, but also on what it contributes to the catalogue. <laughs> Part of Nielsen's Fourth Symphony, the inextinguishable the Danish National Symphony Orchestra, conducted by Fabio Luisi for Deutsche Grammophon. Grammophon's orchestral winner and its recording of the year for 2023. My thanks to Grammophon's editor, Martin Cullingford, and it's to its deputy editor, Tim Parry, for joining me. Well, you can read all about all of the winning artists and albums in the special edition of Gramophone out now. And you can watch the Gramophone Awards on Medici TV, Classic FM's website and Gramophone's website until the end of January. This podcast was produced in association with Wigmore Hall. And this coming week, you can catch a wonderful lineup of Gramophone Award winners in concert, including Mahan Esfahani, Magdalena Kojina, Mitsuko Uchida, Stephen Islis, Alina Ibrahimova and Lisa Davidson. Full details at wigmore-hall.org.uk. Gramophone podcasts are free, but if you enjoy them, then a really great way to support our work is to take out a subscription to Gramophone magazine. Over 13 issues a year, we bring you hundreds of reviews by our expert critics, as well as in-depth articles about the latest classical music releases and the most exciting musicians of the day. And if you head over to gramophone.co.uk slash subscribe and enter the code PODCAST20 in the checkout, you could even get a 20% discount off any subscription package. We really value your support. And consider leaving a review or rating wherever you listen to your podcasts. And do look out for another Gramophone podcast very soon.